All right, so welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a relaxing five to 10 minute break. We're gonna try to catch up as the day goes on. Um, so we're all here to start our first Dean panel of the day. So I hope you're just as excited as we are. Um, many of you took our online survey to go through uh, all the questions that you may have wanted to be asked. We asked um, if you could put your own questions in there or rate several questions that we know over the years have been really popular. So we've collected all of your responses and put them together. And now we're gonna ask over our several Dean's panels today and tomorrow, um, the responses of all of those people that, that do look at your applications and have looked at many, many applications. And they can give you their responses um, and their experience for your questions. So we're gonna start off just by having all of our deans today introduce themselves. Um, do we want to start, Dr. Hill? Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is, thank you. <laughs> Hola. Uh, my name is uh, George Hill. I'm from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. And I've been to this conference several times, and it's always wonderful to see so many people here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, McVib Gameda. I'm from uh, New York University School of Medicine, which is uh, located in Midtown Manhattan in New York. And uh, I have also been here you know, several times over the years, and it's, it's really great to be here. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Leon McDougall. Uh, the Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at The Ohio State University College of Medicine, and welcome. I'm Dr. Ron Brezhnak. I'm Assistant Dean for Academic Affairs and Student Affairs at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. And I think this is my fifth or sixth year here. Very happy to come back. Good morning. I'm Dr. Carl Miller. I'm from Wild Cornell Medical College. I'm the Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Equal Opportunity Programs. And thank you for having me again. I think this is my fourth or fifth time. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kevin Watt. I'm the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at Wright State University Boonshaw School of Medicine, which is in Dayton, Ohio. And this is only my second year, but I, I think it's a well-run uh, conference, and you guys should be commended, uh, those who run it and those who attend it. Well, thank you very much. So we'll start it off about everyone's favorite topic, the MCAT. Um, one of the most popular questions we got was regarding how many times um, people can take the MCAT and if they improve or their scores vary drastically. I mean, obviously you look for an upwards trend, but how much does it weigh against you if you had to take it five times to get that good score as opposed to the person who got it the first time? What do you, what do you see often and what are your thoughts? I noticed when she asked that question, she was looking at me specifically. <laughs> so I'll answer it. What is, what is the um, common folklore these days is don't take it any more than three times in a, in a given period. Um, and they do look at, um, at least some schools, what they do is they look at the highest score. So if the first one you took, your scores were added up to let's say 35, let's say and then you took it again and your scores were 30, and you took it again and it was 32, they would look at the 35, all right? Um, most, the WMC and also AMCAS people would tell you to take it more than three times and do poorly without getting increases on your, it, it, it endangers you um, many times. Some of you may have had that experience. It really does. So that, it, it's three, but it, no one's saying you have to take it three times. You take it in, as many times as you want to. Well, I've served on our admissions committee for the last nine years, and we've seen students who've taken the exam once and seen students who've taken it twice. Uh, I think uh, a student who takes it twice really is not a problem for us at all, at all. In fact, uh, many schools, if you've taken it uh, three times, uh, if you've taken it twice, they average uh, or they look for the highest score in the three components. So if you had 10, 9, 10, and then it was 10, 10, 10, then the score that the committee considers is a 10, 10, 10. And I think that's a very important point because you're rewarding individuals for their best effort. 
they're not saying that uh, it, they went down or something like that. So taking it twice and doing well overall, I think is fine. Uh, we've had students who have applied who have taken it more than twice, and that is not uh, a positive sign. I, I want to add that I, I understand that some of you, and the reason that question comes is because students have had to take it three times or more, otherwise that wouldn't be an, an issue. I think what you need to do is uh, do some self-inventory if you're getting to the second and third time and you're not making those improvements, whether you're taking Kaplan or or in any of these other courses, you might need to seek uh, some other help and, and consider some post-baccalaureate type programs that might help you um, strengthen your application along with having to have uh, taken it at least a third or more time. And, it, and that's what I would encourage you to do because I don't want to kill anybody's dream on they've taken that test three times and, and then now I've got to find something else to do for the next 40 years of my life. So that's just my perspective um, and I think that's what we look at, at, at least at, at Wright State. Taking it the uh, second time, I don't think you should take it the second time until you're really sure you're ready. First time you took it based upon minimal amounts of knowledge that you've heard or gained from your friends who took it, but the second time, do not take it just to take it. You've got to prepare a lot harder the second time than you did the first time, hoping you'll do some introspection. Find out what you did right and wrong the first time. And then whenever you're ready, take it the second time, but just do not think of the calendar. Think of being prepared and take it when you're ready. And don't worry about the calendar. Uh, also, this question is, is deeper than that. It's a question also that goes into, did you pick the right career? That may be a question pertaining to some folks. For example, just actually two weeks ago, uh, someone uh, shared uh, their information uh, with me concerning the fact that they had, they wanted to get into our post-baccalaureate program. We also have a MedPath post-bac program uh, and <coughs> wanted to get some feedback concerning would they be uh, competitive for the post -bac program. And this particular person uh, had taken the MCAT uh, about six, six times. So, <coughs> and scores ranging from uh, first time I think the person took it, 13, somewhere in the middle, went up to like maybe 20, did a health sciences, uh, program, then it went back down to like 16. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I think when you're making the decisions and so forth in regards to taking the, the uh, uh, MCAT, and, and it's good we're having this discussion here, it really, <laughs> you really want to have a discussion with a, uh, one of the uh, admissions officers or the diversity uh, dean at, at, at at your particular uh, institution or nearby institution to really kind of uh, do a more in-depth analysis of, of, of what may be going on in regards to inhibiting you from optimizing uh, your MCAT score. And, and for a few folks, it may be an opportunity to redirect uh, your efforts because for this particular person, okay, it's, it's been like, I think it's been like eight years. And so if that person had chosen to, you know, become a PhD psychologist or a podiatrist or, or uh, uh, any other number of uh, uh, areas where uh, they could contribute uh, to the health profession and decreasing health disparities, they would, out, they would be actually practicing right now. So, I know we want to be positive and so forth with these types of events, but I also want to, because <laughs> I know some folks fit into uh, a category where perhaps instead of taking it for the sixth and seventh time or even the fourth and fifth time, maybe efforts should be redirected towards finding a career path that uh, is going to be uh, not so uh, difficult uh, to get into or one that maybe more matches 
uh, their strengths. So uh, I, I would say that also. All right, um, so that, that brings us to another really popular question regarding uh, taking breaks off in between when you finished um, whatever degree you may have been working on, whether it be a master's, uh, a post back, or your bachelor's. Um, is people that are going to be taking one, two, three years off before they're now going to be applying, as long as they, they know their courses still have to be relevant, but letters of recommendation expire. So I know um, in the past you um, gentlemen have brought up, as long as you have one current uh, letters of recommendation from that time you took off. That's good, but do you guys have a, especially committed if you'd like to address this one, um, have you seen trends in people when they turn in a lot of letter, letters of recommendations that are many years outdated? Um, what do you prefer to see for letters of recommendation? I mean, how current and then if you want to see the ones from the professors, like what trends have you seen in people that take breaks? Um, to answer that question, I, I think you know it's important. The letters of recommendation cover a range of you know inputs that um, that um, the admissions uh, committee looks at, and one of the inputs is the academic side of things. So, it is important to have some relevant letter or inputs from someone that is that is um, associated with with your academic performance. But uh, that said, we're you know we're seeing a lot of students more and more that are coming you know, two or three years down the line after they have graduated and have done a lot of interesting things, you know, have gone on and uh, worked uh, globally and worked, you know, as teachers in different programs. And so they have done incredible things. And those letters are you know, obviously very important. And, and they talk about the character and the work ethic and, and, and the work that, um, that uh, these candidates are doing. So I would think, you know, while you still need, you know, some anchor to, you know, anchor letter regarding your academic performance from your professor or something down the line, um, what you have done and what you're doing right now is very, very important, you know, to us. So. Okay. Um, secondly, do courses taken uh, abroad that do not count towards one's GPA um, do you take those into consideration, the grades they got on them and their experience there? I can only speak for our school um, <clears throat> and perhaps some others as well. The courses, y you talk about science courses? Right. They generally don't count on your, in, in our school, we don't generally consider it unless you are a foreign student, you come from a different country. We take foreign students, not in as, in, as many numbers as we wish we could, but um, they really don't don't add in. Um, if you if you go to, let's say Spain, and you took a course in biochemistry, not unless you were there for a semester and it was sanctioned by your school, would um, it count in your in your GPA? It's the same as uh, same our school as well. Okay. Um, Dr. Hill, um, how do you feel when you're looking through uh, an application? how they've, uh, maybe they've got a similar accomplishments as another application that's very identical to the things that they've done, but regarding their financial background and where they've come from, how much does that factor in when you're comparing the two applications? Thank you very much. And I, thank you very much, and I'm sure our other committee members would comment on it as well. Uh, we consider the distance traveled of an applicant very important. Uh, by that I mean if a student uh, grew up in uh, upper class background, went to a private school uh, for high school, and then went to uh, one of our top institutions in the country, and now they're applying. We see that as moving from here to here, from here to here. If a student grew up uh, in a family where their parental income was uh, very modest, uh, maybe one parent was working or both were working, but they were middle class individuals. They went to a public high school. They went to a state university. They had to work during their uh, experience in undergraduate school. And they have excelled uh, or done very well in terms of uh, the holistic review. We may see that from here in comparison to the other student to here. And we view that 
second student very positively. It's not that we punish the first, but we really need in our medical schools uh, broad diversity of students, including those who come from uh, backgrounds that are uh, what you find in most of the United States. We think that's very, very important. So the distance travel and accomplishments that that student has made, we see are very, very important. Uh, and uh, in many cases, you know, when you look at that application, it has more information than, you know, just income, right? You know, it, you, you have a lot of stories that an applicant tells. So um, when, when you look at uh, um, an application, then the distance traveled, as uh, Dr. Hill says, and, um, and all the other stories that, that go into, you know, what makes an applicant is very important in that decision. So um, in a case of a, a person that has experienced various um, uh, aspects of living, going through and, um, and, and um, uh, excelling, uh, it is an important factor of you know how how that uh, uh, that student's character is formed, and it's very important in terms of you know how we form the class. That that is it's informed by different experiences, and that's where actually good uh, training happens, especially in medicine, when you have you know input from different experiences. We uh, I'm from an osteopathic medical school. And just the way an osteopathic physician train, uh, treats the whole patient, we look at the whole applicant. We consider everything. And we might have a student who came from a rich family who went to an Ivy League school, and we look at the whole application just the exact same way we look at the application from a poor student who came from a, a, a second-rank a second school. Um, one, one of the things that I think you have to think about is the whole person. And that's, that's very, very important because you and someone who can identify with both rich and poor people when they, come, when they become uh, physicians. And so if you had to struggle coming up through the world, you have a little more of a fire in your belly wanting to be a doc, I think. And um, I think that's, that's, that's an important thing. For instance, at, at our school, you know, Hispanic education, uh, Hispanic today in higher education ranks our school is producing the seventh largest number of family of, of primary care physicians who are Hispanic in the United States. We take a lot of people from poor families, from rich families, and they do very, very well. Like I said, we look at the whole applicant. I think there's a central point that everyone is saying. They're not telling you this, but it's, it's what the double AMC is trying to get over in the holistic review process now. Um, they're talking about, you know, you have to balance metrics against experiences, against attributes of the student. When you first look at an, edu at, at an application, the first thing you see is you see the grades, you see the MCATs, the things are very apparent. But as you begin to read it more, you're looking below. You're looking at the student experiences, and then when you finally interview the person, you actually see the attributes of the student. And all those things are very, very important. Diversity. It's extraordinarily important this, uh, in, in this day and age because you can't have excellence without diversity. You just can't, you can't do it. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's because you're, you're looking at one group. My wife and I had an experience, my daughter when she was in, in college, went to um, London to, um, to study for a semester. And she begged us to come over one uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And we went over, we went to the Tate Museum in, in London, and the guerrilla artists, the artists who are posing or looking at, you know, how museums are run around the world, particularly in European countries, is not being excellent. And they gave the example. They said there are no women here. That means women can't do art. There were no African Africans or you know um, Polynesian art there. It wasn't considered. And so when you look at it, you say, well, they're not the only ones who can do art in the world. Give me a break. And then you understand the whole concept of, um, of diversity leading to excellence because it's including the entire body of people. I think that's really, that's really important. One other just quick comment. I think that when we look at the data, it suggests that most of our medical students in this country are coming from uh, backgrounds where at least one parent has a master's level degree. 
And that's not to poo-poo what the parents have done and, and those who are in, in better situations are great. But those who are not in those necessary better situations are, we're looking at those in, in that in a, in a way, uh, this day and age that we have, we understand you cannot continue to um, make physicians that come from upper level backgrounds who then have no connection with the normal person. And if you don't have a connection with that normal person, uh, you don't really know how to interact with them as a human being, let alone as their physician and friend. So that's where a lot of that's coming from. Um, Dr. Watt, additionally, for, for those students who may have decided to join uh, to go for medicine later in the game, or for those who struggle throughout their undergraduate career, how do you weigh graduate coursework versus undergraduate coursework? That's a hard question. It depends on what they're actually doing. I think, uh, at least at my institution, we, those who have decided to go into medicine at a l later stage in the game or have one reason or another weren't able to get in right out of college, if you're taking a graduate level course here or there um, and you're not getting an A in it, it doesn't do you any good because if you've already graduated and you've got 130 credit hours and your BCPM is 60 hours on it, taking one course is not going to change your BCPM uh, hill of beans. It, and likewise, if you're taking gra in a graduate program, uh, MPH or, or whatever it may be, and these courses are not necessarily uh, histology and pathology type courses, it really, it doesn't hurt you, but I'm not sure that we give that person that much more of an edge unless their MCAT score is, is coming up quite high. So. Uh, for me, at least at our at Wright State, what we would like to see people do is to maximize those courses. If they've got to go back and take graduate level courses, then they need to be killing them, um, meaning they need an A. And if they need to take their science courses to meet the requirements, maybe they were a, a different business major and decided they wanted to go back, then they, they again, they need to have this, the best grades in those courses because one, we know they're only taking a couple courses here and there. And then working is not really an excuse. I think if those students want to go to medical school and they're working full time and only could get a B in the course, well, maybe your effort is not there. Maybe the desire is really not there. So it takes a point where you have to quit work and go and do what you want to do, And just something actually in my situation I did. I was working and, and I quit my job and then I went uh, and did what I needed to do to get into medical school. And I sit before you as a practicing ophthalmologist and as an assistant dean at, the, at, my, at my medical school, which I graduated from. Well, that question actually speaks to our earlier question in regards to the number of times one takes the MCAT. So uh, not just take a graduate course, you should get a graduate degree. And then when you finish that biomedical science related graduate degree, then retake the MCAT and then once that improvement is noted, people will take a look at your MCAT and how you've done in, in your graduate program. And just FYI, uh, anything less than a B in graduate school is considered a failure. <laughs> it's an F. <laughs> so if you think you got, I got a C, you know, or, or you know, <laughs> so that's not good. So, uh, so either another option could be uh, enrolling in a formal post-baccalaureate uh, program. There are a number of them across the U.S. and many of them are uh, particularly focused on groups underrepresented in medicine and from disadvantaged backgrounds. There's about 20, 22 or so uh, throughout the U.S. and uh, you can look on the uh, AAMC website to actually find out the particular uh, names of those programs. The Ohio State University MedPath is, <laughs> is one of them, so. I think this, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I think this really begs the question of why are you here? Because I think that, you know, to really consider someone who's gone through four years of college, you say, I want to be a doctor, and come up short, much shorter than you expect, and not get into medical school, is something w perhaps wrong with your decision. And more and more people get beginning to think that, which is why if you go to any medical school and look at the class, you don't see a whole lot of post backs in there. You don't see a whole lot of people with, with, with MD, with PhDs in there. You don't see a whole lot of people with masters in there. Because in that, that's, that's not the criteria. It's not how much you can do. We expect you to go into medicine for the right reasons. How many of you know why you want to go into medicine? Raise your hands. How many of you sort of don't know? 
it's kind of a trick question, right? Everyone put their hands down. We really, we really, we re it, the emphasis being made, if you want to go into medicine, you, we think you should be really serious about it and know what you're doing. If you're going to medicine because it seems cool to have MD license plates, or it seems really cool to be called doctor, or whatever, it's not the right reason. Right now, our country is at a crossroads, and we're depending on young people to help us bridge that gap. Disparities are incredibly high, if you know about that. Um, we have great segments of our population who are not um, are being treated um, um, in a traditional way with medicine. You guys, we're depending on you, because we're getting old, at least I am. <laughs> Is that you? Okay, good for you. <laughs> but we, we really need, I mean, it's, it becomes a social issue. And I'm not saying, I'm not trying to politicize why you're going to medicine. I'm trying to make it real to you why you're going to medicine. Um, a few years ago, we were right at the top. Now we're number 40 in the world. We're a space-faring group of people, and we can't take care of our own people. So make the right decisions. I think if you make the right decisions about why you're going to medicine and you really stick to it, you will make it because you will be dedicated to serving your patients in the future and not for the M MD behind your name or anything like that. That's the whole point. The point is about patients. If you're not doing it because you want to take care of patients or you want to really get, do that research, mm -hmm then it may be the wrong reason for you because it's, don't forget, more than half the people who apply to medical school do not get in. So I think it's an important question for you to ask yourself, how much are you willing to sacrifice in order to get, reach your goal? But wouldn't, wouldn't this question though, I, I hear what you're saying, uh, and most of the folks that I speak to from a counseling standpoint, it, I don't think it's so much that they don't want to be a physician uh, and I don't think it's so much motivation, but many folks haven't gone to a uh, conference like this and may not know exactly how they should proceed and the correct way to uh, schedule your classes, what classes you should be taking. They may not have an excellent pre-med advisor. They may have had some other things going on at home that really prevented them from excelling as an undergrad. And that graduate degree program is their opportunity to really show that they have what it takes to get into a medical school once they've kind of figured out things uh, the hard way, you know, the, the, the experience. We're talking about the <laughs> experience. Maybe sometimes people don't, I, I know when I was, <laughs> you know, uh, coming up, I heard of an African-American doctor, a legend in our town. Uh, no one was telling me what I yeah, should man. do. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I, I was on, on, on the basketball team, and I can remember vividly in, in, in practice one day, the coach said, you think you want to be a doctor? You're never going to be a doctor, you know? So, so you're not, sometimes people are in situations where uh, despite their desire to be a physician, they don't quite know exactly what they need to know no, to right. get to that point. I'm so not, I'm, I'm not saying yeah, that. Okay. I'm not saying that. You know, you, you, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a different aspect. I had to say I had horrible experiences. I grew up in the South Bronx. I was I I, I went through um, educational hell. Um, because of the racism in this country. So I know what exists out there. I'm talking about the student within himself. What is your reason why you really want to go into medicine? And if you really find that reason, you find a kernel of that belief in that reason, you will seek out the things, that, the opportunities, because we have them. I was nothing like this when I was in, you know, I went to school in the 70s, the early 70s. There was nothing like this. There wasn't even a black doctor in my community. So we had to seek out those things that were really going to be relevant for us to continue on. So I'm saying if you really want to do it, there are ways you can do it. That's why we have these panel discussions, and that's why we're here to help you, um, you know, make those decisions and choices and ho hopefully reach your goal. One quick comment. In regards to your advisor, I mean, you guys are, whether you're on scholarship or not, you are... Uh, they are your advisor, and I tell my students that all the time, that I am just an advisor. And you guys have to take the information that the advisor gives you and apply it to your life. You are not a robot. Just because the advisor says do it, doesn't mean that's the best thing for you. You have to make a decision as a young adult 
that you have to live with those consequences because you can't then say, my advisor told me this and it didn't work out. And you want to blame the advisor mm -hmm. when you as a young adult have a decision to make on your life. Uh, one more thing that I would, I would like to add is that I think this is a very good conversation and just going back to that issue of uh, whether to go into take graduate courses or go to graduate school um, in order to improve your undergraduate record, right? That's the question. When you do those kind of things, just think, you know, as everybody's discussing, you have to go one up. So you're not doing that just to correct that grade. Think about what you're getting from that new experience that you're going into. So let that graduate experience be a whole new experience that is leading you to the next spot. Then you would, the framework will change. It will not be, oh, I got you know, this C grade in the undergrad, so I'm going to take a graduate course and to get to correct that. It would be, I'm taking this course, I'm growing, I'm developing, and I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now, you know, taking these courses. You have to go in that direction of framing your journey in something that is, you know, that, that, is, that makes sense, rather than, you know, it's just thrown around all over, and, you know, you have this course, and that course, and this grade, and this MCAT. It should be a journey that you, are, you embrace, and you take it with you. And if that is the case, you will have fun, and you will enjoy it, and you will excel. This afternoon, I'm giving a workshop on planning versus preparing for medical school. Come to it. You'll learn about how to develop a roadmap, a real serious high standard roadmap that you have to develop for yourself to apply and get into medical school. So uh, along with this same vein, um, Dr. Miller, uh, we're talking about having access to good pre-med advisors or not having access and how that can affect how direct one's path is. So how do you view an applicant or two applicants, one coming from a top tier school and one coming from a secondary school, and look at their paths, their GPAs even, how do you compare, or do you take into account the school? What is a top tier school? Well, and I'm really question. serious, what is a top tier school? I mean, I know schools are very popular, but I don't know if they're gonna be any tops over any other school. I don't, what, because they have better teachers, they have better resources. What is a top tier school? If you can find that for me, I think that I can embrace your question, but I, I've always, people have always asked me that question. Recom, a top tier school. I don't know. Is that your school? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I'm, what I'm saying, I think most medical schools, yeah, they look at the school that you go to because they're very familiar with that school. But I don't think, if you went to, came to Cornell, you see that 50% of the students there are from Ivy League colleges, but all the other 50 students, because there's 100 students at Cornell, all the other 50 are from schools some people never heard of, and they do that purposely because that adds to diversity, the educational diversity of the school. So I, I don't know, you know, what, what, I don't know if any medical school says we're only going to take people from our top tier schools, and they may be speaking of Ivy League schools, I just don't know of any like that. I think that what they do is they look at the, they try to look at the student in a very holistic way, see where the student has come from, what their goals were, how they achieved those, those goals, how they went about it, their maturity and those things to really make the decision. I, I don't think it's just one pat answer that we can say, you know, we only take Ivy League su students. I think that that's uh, absolutely correct. Um, I believe this question goes to the heart of the type of review that an admissions committee makes, and there is not going to be any single type of institution where the student will have one leg up. Uh, a student can come from a small liberal arts school or from uh, an Ivy League school or from a state school, and the issue is how has the student done, how have they dealt with challenges, and when one looks at the application totally and holistically, uh, how does this student compare with others? So I think the institution itself uh, really plays a minimal role. I think part of that is you guys believe for some reason that you have to come from a certain place to go to medical school. I think where it helps us, at least regionally, for where we're at, we have 
track records with students who have come from certain places and how they've done and how they've fared at our medical school. I think you, you also look at that in the realm of I'm going to pick XYZ medical school because I want to go into XYZ type of residency. And what you need to understand is that every medical school in this country is accredited. And that's all requ is required to get into a residency is that you're coming from an accredited uh, medical school. If you want a particular type of research that you want to do t for uh, a PhD or, or something, then you might need to partic pick a particular medical school for that reason. But you can go to any medical school in this country and get any type of residency that you choose. And I would hold that to anybody to, to tell me otherwise because I graduated medical school 15 years ago at Wright State. And 15 years ago, Wright State was only 15 years old. So it was a very young medical school. And I practice ophthalmology in a field where in my town, there's only two black ophthalmologists and probably less than 700 in the country. So coming from a small place, you have to believe one in yourself and do, do the work at medical school to get where you want to go. So you can go anywhere you want to go and do anything you want to do. But that's in your brain that you got to believe that first. Okay. Uh, one last final question. Um, and this is talking about uh, students who work as an EMT or uh, physician's assistant um, sometime during the break, how that helps their application, or if you feel that that experience could be comparable to students that do regular clinical experience, is it another kind of holistic review, or do you recommend students really pursue something like getting even their CNA license or something like that if, if it's before to expose themselves to the field? Um, Dr. Dr. Want me to take it? Um, um, I think that is a great experience. Some schools are actually, you know, integrating that into their, um, their medical curriculum. And um, we have had students that were actually PAs before they did, you know, they were PAs before entering the medical school. And we've had, you know, like fantastic experiences with them. So there is, you know, um, obviously, uh, it's not a requirement that you come with medical experience to enter medical school. You can be a dancer or a writer or whatever it is that you're going to do in, in, in undergrad. But uh, that said, having um, significant, meaningful clinical experience that is practical, you know, more practical than, you know, just the shadowing experience that is the usual thing that, that uh, we do, is, I think, a good thing. I think the word that really defines what she's describing is passion. And that, I agree with Dr. Lameda that, you know, you do need um, to do something. If you're going to go into medicine, yeah, you should do a little clinical work. But that doesn't, doesn't mean that you should exclude everything else. Take that dance. Write those poems. Do that music. It's very, very important that you have balance. But whatever you do, do it because you want to do it. Don't do it because it looks good on your application. That's a common mistake that students make. I've been on the admissions committee for 31 years, and you can begin to see through a lot of that, the things students put on their advocacy application. Believe me, um, someone will pick it up. But do it because you really want to do it, whether it's clinical, it's research, or whatever. Do it because you really want to do it, and not necessarily because it's going to look good on your application. It may look very good, but do it because you really want to do it. I think the more knowledge you have about the profession you would like to join, the more sure you would be about, about entering that field. Uh, if you've experienced in the clinical world, you know what a doc does. You know what a doc doesn't do. And, and, and it's going to make you help make your decision, yes, that's what I want to do. I don't mind giving up a dance recital with my daughter if I have a patient dying in the hospital. If you've seen this, you're going to know maybe, maybe that's not for me. Maybe I'm too much with the family and I'm not willing to give it up. Well, maybe you might think twice about going into medicine. But at the same time, if you realize that your goal is to save lives and help others, then maybe missing a dance recital or two, it's not going to bother you when, you, when another human being is going to be walking the very, very next day. Okay, well then I would like to give a big round of applause to our first Dean Panels of the Day. Thank you everyone.